join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we rejoice in your name this morning and who you are. We thank you so much for your teaching and this time together that is so important, especially in these times that we are in, Lord. So would you lead us and guide us and speak to us this morning? We pray in Jesus' name, the only name we say. Amen. amen and amen. Good morning and welcome. You can be seated. So glad you're here. Those of you online, we're so glad that you're joining with us. You know what's going to happen today? We're going to finish the very lengthy book of Jude today. Yeah, I was thinking maybe a different reaction. So the last two verses of chapter one, because there's only one chapter, and I explained to you why I like to put the one there, because you know, some people are just wired that way. It bugs them if they just see 24 and 25 without the one, because it's like something's missing. That's why I put the one there. So, well, I mean, you know what I could do is I could say, hey, would you join me and turn in your Bibles to Jude chapter 2? Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. Quit while I'm ahead. Verses 24 and 25 are our text. We're going to, Lord willing, finish the book of Jude today. And Lord willing, and if we're still here, next Sunday we are going to start a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Revelation. That's a better response to <laughs> good, good save. Uh, also, this Thursday, having completed Ezekiel last Thursday, we are going to begin a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Daniel. So Daniel, Revelation, it doesn't get any better than that. So if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. Jude, by the Holy Spirit, now concludes his letter and writes, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Wow. What an ending, huh? I feel like we should just close in prayer right there. But we will pray. Would you join with me? Father, thank you. Wow. Just wow. Thank you for Jude, for this letter for these last two verses that are here before us this morning, Lord. This is our portion here in Your Word. And now we need for the Holy Spirit to open up the eyes of our understanding into why it is that You would have Jude write this and end his letter this way. Certainly there is something for us today here. So we need for the Holy Spirit to minister to us what it is that, and why it is that we have this in our Bibles. It's here for a reason. So what is that reason, Lord? Will you speak that into our lives, as only you can and are always faithful to? We ask in Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. And you can be seated. Thank you. So here in these last two verses, we have what's affectionately referred to as the most famous doxology in all of Scripture. Now what's a doxology? A doxology is a bursting forth with the most grand and glorious declaration of praise and worship and adoration of our only God and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Have you ever had that happen? When you're spending time with the Lord, you're in the Word, you're in prayer, 
And I mean, the Holy Spirit just so fills you to overflowing. You just can't contain it. And I mean, out comes just the most glorious praise, effortlessly. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit in you, praising God. Who is like unto you, God? Oh, praise be unto you, O God. You are the true and the living God. And before you know it, you're going on and on and on. And oh, by the way, God inhabits the praises of His people. And then the presence of God is so pronounced during those times. That's a doxology. That's why it is, by the way, when you come to church, say on a Thursday night, you're just beat, tired. You've had a rough day at work. In fact, the whole week's been rough. In fact, everything's been rough. <laughs> and you get home and you want to get to the Bible study and you make the fateful mistake of eating something for dinner and then maybe eating more than you should have. And the next thing you know, a drowsiness, the likes of which you have never experienced before in your life, sets in and your eyes start to close up and you can't keep your eyelids open. And you're thinking to yourself, man, maybe I'll just watch online. I, I didn't mean that to be we love it that you're watching online. Now, if you're down the street watching online, that's between you and the Lord, our only God and Savior, Jesus the Christ. But then you just know that you're going to be so blessed if you go. So you pick yourself up and you get ready and you get in the car and you get to church and you sit down and Capono starts leading worship and you're like, yeah. And where'd the drowsiness go? Bye bye. Why did it go bye bye? Because that was the enemy trying to keep you from the one who keeps you and inhabits the praises, inhabits the praises. When you praise and worship Him, He's present there. And then you're just so glad that you came, because the Lord meets you there and inhabits the, the praises that you're lifting up to Him. And this is basically what Jude's doing here. He's letting us in on, better said, God is allowing us to see this bursting forth from Jude of this praise, this adoration, this awe of God. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, when they asked Him, teach us how to pray, we refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17, when the Lord prayed before He was to be crucified. That was the Lord's Prayer. But in Matthew 5, we're taught how to pray. And the very first thing is expressing adoration and awe of our God, who is hallowed, which is a word we don't really know or understand much in our vocabulary today. It's just expressing an awe, an adoration, a praise, a worship. Here's one for you. I was just thinking about this. And we will get to the (laughs) Bible study and sermon shortly. Um, And this might be for somebody here today. You know how we always pray, Lord, bless me, bless this, bless them, bless that. Have you ever thought about when you pray you're blessing God. When was the last time, I mean, we thank God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. But when was the last time we said, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. No, we're asking for the blessing. But unbeknownst to us, when we pray, we're blessing God. It's a blessing to the heart of God, to praise God, to thank God, to be in awe of God. Well, we're still in the introduction, so be patient with me. These last two verses, I mean, 
isn't it true, I think you would agree, I'm not, um, I'll include myself in this, because I'm just as prone as the next guy. When you get to the end of a book like this, as short as it is, you get to these last two verses, it's kind of like, well, just read past it. Let's get to Revelation. It's kind of like the beginning of a letter, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of like, let's just get to the, let's get to the meat. Let's get, let's get to the, let's get, let's get down to business. So we, we tend to dismiss the beginning and the ending. I liken it to, and, and this is probably a very poor comparison. If you got a better one, please let me know. But be nice when you do. Um, you know, at the end of a movie, when they have the credits, when was the last time you ever saw somebody sitting there with their popcorn? Going, no, no, it's the credits. I've been waiting for this ending. I want to see. That's not a very good, again, I know it's not a very good illustration, but you get the point. Well, that's kind of how we treat the Word of God when it's the ending. Oh, it's just the credit. Send my greetings to, you know, uh, so-and-so, and give my love to, have Timothy bring me the parchments and my cloak. It's kind of cold here in this, you know, dungeon of a prison. And, you know, greet so-and-so, watch out for so-and-so. They did me great harm, by the way, and by name, by the way. And we, we just think, well, that's just the credits, nothing to see here, and we leave. Don't do that. There is so much here for us. I, my prayer is, after spending much time seeking the Lord, is that I'm going to be able, by the Holy Spirit, to teach these two verses correctly and rightly dividing them in such a way that it's a blessing and an encouragement to all of us, myself included. And it's for this reason that I'm choosing and using this title. You keep who keeps you. I know it sounds clever, doesn't it? It doesn't? Okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. Sorry I brought it up. I thought it did. <laughs> you keep who keeps you? The inference is, is that we won't keep the one who keeps us. Now watch this and, and think through this with me. Jude is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write prior to this glorious doxology in verse 21, which we covered last week, keep yourself in God's love. I'm not going to re-preach last week's sermon, so take heart. But the inference is, is that there's this potential for us to not keep ourselves in God's love. Just ask the Ephesian church, who left their first love, did not keep themselves in God's love. They didn't lose it. That would mean you could try to find it. No, they left it. It was an act that they deliberately left their first love. They did not keep themselves in their first love. Now, God is going to, through Jude, inspired by the Holy Spirit, bring to the forefront how it is that God keeps us we keep God who keeps us, and we in turn keep Him who keeps us from a fall, and presents us without a fault. Kind of rhymed. But He's the one who keeps us when we keep Him who keeps us. And I'm hoping that you'll kindly allow me to share with you three truths. And I hope this doesn't come off as being sensational. And I know I say it often. I hope you don't tire of me saying it. But this has the potential and the propensity to change our life in every arena of our life. 
because that's how God's Word is. It can be life changing. Who knew these last two verses in this very short book of Jude could be so life changing. Now, Pastor, you say that often. I just said that I said that often. But truth be made known, these two verses, they can change everything. If we understand and embrace and allow the Holy Spirit to build it into our lives, the application of it to our lives, if we really understand these two verses, it can change everything in your life. I hope that's not an oversimplification, but again, if you'll kindly allow me to, I'll explain how this can happen and be so life-changing first in the first part of verse 24. I want you to notice the emphasis. I'm saying it this way for a reason. He keeps us from falling. In other words, we can't keep ourselves from falling, but He can. This is Jude succinctly summing up this life-changing truth that God, as only He can, is able to keep us from falling. Now that doesn't mean that we're never going to fall or stumble or sin. But He's the one who is able. We don't do it in the energy of our own flesh, our own strength. It's not by might or power, my might or willpower, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. I can keep you. I am able. Now, Pastor, why are you saying this this way? I'm saying this this way because God's Word is replete with promise after promise. And I want you to listen very carefully, that no matter what, God is able. God is able. You and I are not able. We are unable. But God is able. Now stay with me on this. How am I going to do this? You're not. I am unable to do this. God is. What am I going to do about this? This does not look good. This is really bad. This is really, really bad. I don't know how I'm going to be able to keep from, and you fill in the blank. Oh, so when did you have God sign over the ownership of that problem to you? There was like a transfer of title, a title transfer. I went to the DMV this last week, so I'm thinking in those terms. It wasn't in my notes, but it was uh, on my calendar for this last week. Oh, it was actually a very good experience. Um, Lisa, she told me she'd been working there for 33 years. I said, bless your heart. You are very good. You are very pleasant. And you are very fast too. And I thanked her. But I had to transfer a title. And it's so interesting. And this is actually, this might turn out to be a pretty good example for a change. You're, you're signing over the ownership of this to the new owner. Now they're the legal owner of this that you're signing it over to. How am I doing so far? Are we good? Okay. Watch what we do. And we do this to our own peril, I might add. We either refuse to sign over the ownership of that problem that we're unable to solve to God, who is able to solve it, and we keep it. We keep it. Or how about this one? We go, we pray, Oh Lord, take this. We cast all your cares on Him, for He cares for you. And I mean, you pray, and you leave it there, and then a couple hours later you sneak back and take it back. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. 
And here's how you'll know. Because when you cast your cares upon Him, you weren't worrying about it anymore. So you were free. And now there's nothing to fear. There's no stress. There's no worry. Worry about no thing. Thank God for anything. Pray about everything. And the peace of God from the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So you're doing pretty good there for a while. So you gave it to the Lord. Lord, you are able. And then you left. And now you don't know what to do with yourself because you don't, you're not worrying anymore. <laughs> yeah. So what are you going to do with all that time that you spent worrying? And here you just transferred ownership to the Lord. So you go back, you have not signed it back over to you so you can worry about it. Worry is like a rocking chair, one said. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. So let me see if I can kind of tie this up so we can move on to the second one. He is able to keep us. He is able. Not me. Not we. He is able no matter what it is. I don't know what it is. You may not want me to know what it is. Only you and the Lord know what it is. But only God is able on this one. And could it be that God has allowed it to become impossible so that you are unable? Because that's the only time you'll give it to Him who is able to keep you from falling. Because this looks like this is how it ends. Let me see if I can, um, I think this might be the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I think about it in the context of a parent, a father, a mother, with a prodigal son or a wayward daughter. And I mean, you never knew you could love so deeply a child until you are a parent. Remember when your parents said that to you, something along the lines of, you wait till you have children of your own. My mom used to say that to me with her accent and her high pitched voice. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Then I had children of my own. And then it's kind of like, I told you so. <laughs> You just wait. I mean, wow, if I would have, oh, I would have been, I would have been a much easier child. I put my mom, bless her heart, through so much. But you never knew you could love so deeply. And I mean, this son, this daughter, they're wayward and they're just shredding and tearing your heart into just pieces, you know. And you're unable, unable. And you don't know what to do. And quite frankly, there's nothing you really can do. But God can. Because we want to protect our children from failure, from falling, from harm, from danger. How are we going to keep them out of trouble? You can't. You can't go to the place where they are, but God can. And here's another thing. You cannot, you are unable to love them as much as God loves them. How about that? God loves your son, your daughter, more than you, infinitely more than you ever could. And God wants them kept right with Him, in Him, more than you ever could. You see where I'm going with this? So why not then give it to the one who is able, knowing that you are unable. You can't keep them, keep yourself from this. But God can. God is able. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? 
Is his arm too short that he cannot save? Is he not the God of the impossible? With man this is impossible, but with God it is possible. In fact, I'm convinced, and I've learned in my own life, and my own walk with the Lord, that <laughs> because this is the way I'm wired, God knows that I'll try in my own strength, my own ability, thinking I'm able, I can do this. And so the Lord just lets me, because He's not going to force Himself on me. And then I end up making a bigger mess out of this thing. And God's just waiting patiently, long suffering. And I come to Him and I throw my hands up and I say, Oh God, there's no way. This is impossible. To which I just hear the angels given charge concerning me saying, It's about time. You know, you could have saved yourself a lot of heartache had you just but come to God first and said, God, I am not able. You are able. Will you do this? Will you keep me from this? Will you do this for me and instead of me? Because it's impossible to me. And God says, good. I allowed it to be impossible for you so that it could be possible for me. Because see, if it's still possible for you, then in all fairness to me, it's impossible for me because it's still possible for you. See, it's not possible for me because you won't give it to me for me to do. If it's still possible for you, you're still trying to figure it out, work it out. And here's God just going, you would think J.D. after all these years would get it. You'll notice how I'm taking one for the team here, using myself as an example. Man, you would think he would get it after like the 3,928th time, but who's counting? Where he's just trying to pull himself up by the bootstraps, as they say, roll up his arm sleeves, and I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to do this. I am able. <laughs> I know God's got a sense of humor, and I know God laughs. That's biblical. I can't wait to hear what his laugh sounds like. You know, there's different kinds of laughs. There's like the courtesy laugh. <laughs> there's a belly laugh. <laughs> there's the machine gun laugh. <laughs> Shouldn't use gun illustrations, but I did. But God's just laughing, just with an endearing laugh, like, oh, J.D., not again. <laughs> and he's laughing, not really at me, but kind of with me, like, you're too funny. You really think that you're able. No, you're not. I'll be here when you figure out that you're unable. And when you come to me and realize that I am able to keep you from falling, then I will keep you from falling. Now we're going to see this in the second part of verse 24. Not only does He keep us from falling, He presents us without fault. Again, this does not mean sinless, blameless. He presents us justified, just if I'd never sinned. I'm justified. He, he's removed my sin as far as the east is from the west, though they be as scarlet. He has made them white as snow and remembers them no more. As far as He's concerned, He sees not my sin. He sees His Son who paid in full for all my sin. So I'm faultless. And now I'm going to be, I'm kept, and now I'm presented to Him without fault. But notice, I don't know if you caught this, it's not just without fault, it's with great joy. And there's a connection between the two. Because isn't it true that when there's fault, there's blame, there's sin, there's a fall, it comes packaged with joylessness? I have a book in my library, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, called Spiritual Depression. One of the things that he writes about in that book is that you cannot have joy. You cannot make yourself happy 
but you can have joy. And there's a difference between happiness and joy. See, happiness comes from happenstance. And happiness is predicated on the circumstances of your life warranting such. In other words, I'm happy because things are good. Which, (laughs) if you're only happy when things are good, I'll I'll speak for myself again. I'm probably going to be happy about maybe 45 seconds a week, because that's about the only time that things are good. And that's the only time I can be happy is when things are good. No, no, joy is a whole different thing. See, joy is not predicated upon what's going on in your life. Joy is a constant, because it's not dependent upon the circumstances. The joy comes from the Lord, because it's the joy of the Lord. And you can be in the midst of the most difficult and painful trial of your life, and yet you can have joy How about James? If you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, when you first came upon that verse, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. I'm thinking, surely the translators messed up on this one. Consider it pure joy. Maybe if I go to the original, it it really carries with the idea of consider it pure hell when you're encountering various trials, because that's what I, joy? (laughs) No. Uh, But then you've got to read on. Consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials, trials of various kinds, difficult trials, knowing where God's going with what God's allowing what God's producing. What's He producing? Endurance, perseverance. And here we pray, God, give me endurance. Do you know what you're asking for? So God's like, are you sure? Yes, give me perseverance and endurance. Here come the trial. The only way you're going to get endurance for the trial is by going through the trial, because it's in the trial that the perseverance and the endurance is found. Wait a minute. (laughs) So, and I'm supposed to be joyful about this? So here comes the trial, and I'm praying for endurance, and God's saying, I'm answering your prayer. Well, God, I didn't read the fine print that it would have to be by way of a trial. Isn't there another way? Here's one. I prayed years ago, God make me a man of prayer. So He gave me two sons. (laughs) I'm on my knees. Oh God, I'm a man of prayer. I did not know that that was how God was going to answer that prayer. Be careful what you pray for, they say. There's something to that. So you're praying for perseverance and endurance. And God's like, well, the only way I can give you and answer that prayer for you, the endurance and the perseverance that you're asking for, is by putting you in the furnace of affliction to refine you. (laughs) Isn't there another way? Like, isn't there a prescription that I can get, you know, perseverance, 30-day prescription? No, that's the only way. So great joy. So let me see if I've got this straight. So He keeps me. I keep who keeps me. And He keeps me from falling. And He presents me without fault and with great joy. And the great joy is proportionate to being without fault. Now stay with me. It's when I realize that in Christ I am justified, the great joy ensues. Because the opposite of that is if I've got that hanging over me, debiting my account, it remains heretofore unpaid. Well, now I'm burdened down. I'm not lifted up. I certainly don't have great joy. I have a great debt. You see how that works? You see the connection there? So no wonder Jude would then burst out with this glorious doxology. 
I mean, throughout Scripture, you can search the Scriptures, and you would be hard pressed to find its equal in the pages of Holy Writ. These two verses where he just, I mean, he can't contain himself. Paul does it too, but I think Jude's more of a, wow, oh, because of who God is and what God does. And this is forever. I can't contain it. And that's verse 25. He does and is this forevermore. Now, again, I'm sorry if this doesn't work, but I'll do my best. You know, sometimes there's an expiration date, like this is good for 30 days. This offer is only good for 30 days. So here's God. He's offering us this being kept from the fall, presented without fault, and with great joy, limited time only, for 30 days. And then the offer is no longer valid. Yeah, it didn't work at all. I tried, Lord. No, there's no expiration date on this. There's no limit to this. This is forever and ever and ever, for all of eternity, forevermore. No wonder. Here's Jude. Did you notice this inexhaustible and inexpressible list that Jude just burst forth with. And thank you, God, that it was recorded and kept for us in the canon of Scripture for almost 2,000 years later, when we would be here today to bask in the glory of this praise that has lifted up the God. Can I just go through this list, each one a sermon unto itself? So we'll get out of here by about four. No, I won't do that. Let's start with this one. Wisdom, glory, majesty, dominion. How about those that have been given over to the false teaching of dominion theology? Now, you don't have dominion. God has dominion power and authority. How about those given over to the false teaching of name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. You have the authority, just claim it. If you just have enough faith, you have the power. <laughs> no, God does. God has the authority. Wisdom, glory, majesty, dominion, power, authority, and that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface, as they say. I think Jude just brought the letter to an end, and what an end to the letter, short in length, but certainly not strength, with just unspeakable glory and majesty. And it's forever. <laughs> Amen. So be it. Okay, so Pastor Fancy Pants, you said that this was going to be life changing. Um, how is this life changing? Here's how it's life changing. When I live my Christian life this way, and I praise God this way, and I worship God this way for who He is, in such awe, in all of His glory and majesty. You know what that does to you? It changes you from the inside out. Try this. I'm going to use a personal example from my own life. Many years ago, I was going through a very uh, difficult, painful experience. And I just, you know, you know, when you're curled up in a fetal position, and maybe this is for somebody here watching online, but you're curled up in the fetal position. And I mean, 
Forget praying with words. I mean, you're tr- and liquid prayers, all you can do is weep, and then the tear ducts dry up, and then all you can do is groan, and then you're so discouraged and in such despair that you can't even groan anymore. It's just a silent cry from the heart, because the pain is so intense, and the pain is so deep. And and it's even hard to, you know, hey, open up the Psalms, you know, just start. But I, I, first of all, my eyes are, you know, from crying, they're, they're swollen, they're, you know, red, they're, I can't even read, I can't even do that. All I could do is just lay here. And then God rushes in. And He speaks to your heart. And on this particular occasion, God just ministered to me. I'm not talking about audibly, you know, like, God spoke to me. Wow, was it audible? Oh, I talked about this first service. Be careful with that. God speaks. I'm not dismissing God speaking audibly. That's certainly biblical. But when you say, God showed me, what you're really saying is, He didn't show you. Or God told me, whoa. You know what's, what's really bad is when somebody says, God told me this about you. Well, why didn't He just tell me? Why did He have to go through you? Are we not on speaking terms here? I mean, is He giving me like the silent treatment or something? I mean, God, God showed me this. Well, why didn't he, he didn't show me. God told, I have, let me have this one, okay. God told me this. Well, He didn't tell me. I wish He would have told me. I don't know why He didn't tell me what apparently He told you about me. He could have just come to me, you know. So He spoke to my heart. What does that mean? You know that still small voice of the Holy Spirit? And you know it's Him, because the sheep knows the shepherd's voice. We talked about that too. That's a thing, by the way. Um, You bring in a different shepherd, and those sheep will not recognize the voice, because their ears are tuned to the voice of their shepherd. And so when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep hear my voice, what He's saying is, you're tuned to my voice. You will not recognize a different voice, because I'm the shepherd. And you recognize my voice. And so you know it's the Lord speaking to your heart. It always has to be compatible with the Word of God. And it also has to come with the peace of God from the God of peace. If it's not compatible with the Word of God, or there's no peace of God, it's not God. But when God speaks, He does so, so clearly that a fool could not err thereof. And this was like that for me. He just spoke to my heart. He said, I just want you to start singing to me. You know, and of course, being the godly pastor that I am, you know, I was like, Lord, I don't feel like it. I just don't feel like singing right now. I can't even really I don't feel like doing anything right now. I just feel like laying here right now. This has hurt so bad. No, I just want you to sing. So I won't sing to you, <laughs> but I just sing to him. And the song that I would sing to the Lord was Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, when Jesus washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. There's another one. It's a hymn of old, classic, timeless. Pass me not. O gentle Savior, while on others you are calling, do not pass me by. 
because I'm really hurting right now. And as I began to sing, it was pretty rough at first. Of course, when I sing, it's rough anyway, but it was really rough at first. The tears started flowing again. I'm, I'm praying. I mean, I'm singing songs that do not represent how I'm feeling. But then it wasn't but a short time before the songs that I was singing began to represent the feelings from the inside out. Then all of a sudden it was, oh, happy day. And then I do the other one that Capone was so gracious to do. It doesn't mean you have to do this, unless you want to, of course. But God, you're so good to me. See, now what's happening? Well, first of all, like I mentioned, God is inhabiting the praises of His people. So His presence is there. And Psalm 1611 says, in His presence is found fullness of joy. You see how that works? So He inhabits his, with His presence his, the praises of His people, and then in His presence is fullness of joy. Then all of a sudden, here I am, I can't even do anything. And then He wants me to start singing praises to Him, and I start praising Him. And then all of a sudden it changed everything. It changed me. And I was never the same again. And the next time, and there is a next time, sorry to ruin your afternoon, but the trial hits again. And you still have that taste in your mouth from the last time. You've tasted from this cup. Only this time you remember what God did last time so you repeat the first works, what worked at first, when you were in your first love, kept in your first love. Re remember, repent, repeat. When you remember what it was like when you were in first in love, and then you repent, you do a 180, and you repeat and do what worked at first. I don't feel like it. Do it, and the feelings will follow. It'll change how you feel. And I know that, <laughs> I don't want to look at anybody when I say this, I'll use myself again. I mean, we, let's be honest with ourselves, we operate and function in our Christian lives, giving way too much prominence to our feelings. The righteous shall live by faith, not feelings. So feelings sometimes supersede that which we really need, which is faith. In some ways, the antithesis of feelings. So you might be here today and, man, you're dry. <laughs> and what I'm preaching on and talking about is sort of foreign to you. I mean, just before the Lord, it's been quite a while since I've had that kind of an intimacy or an experience with the Lord. And here I am. I mean, I'm, I'm dying inside, going through this very painful trial in my life. Well, God is extending this offer to you. There's no limited time on this. It's for all eternity, forevermore. Notice Jude says, now presently and future for all eternity. So in other words, you have unfettered access to this now. This is not just in eternity. This is for eternity, starting now, right now, right here, today. This is accessible for you. You can change. You can't make yourself happy, but you can allow God unfettered access to that recess in your heart to change your heart as only He can. And it will change your life from the inside out. And no longer do you look at that situation through the same lens that you had prior. Because now you've just been reminded of the joy of your salvation. When I would sing that song, Oh Happy Day, 
when Jesus washed my sins away, I needed that reminder. I'm saved, man. I'm not weighed down by, a, by my sin. It's been taken care of and paid for. Oh, happy day. That's right. I needed to be reminded of that and express that. And one last thing. <laughs> Did I say one last thing yet? I didn't, right? So we're good. Okay. I won't go in depth into this, but I do want to mention this. You know that we were created to worship. You know the effect of music on the brain? And God has the schematics, the blueprint. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> Guys, you're going to love this one. This is no extra charge, by the way. Did you know that the only time we as men are using both sides of our brain, left and right, is when we sing? So start singing, man, because <laughs> that's the only time, you know, because the le left brain, right brain, women's brain, different than the man's brain, brain, brain. No, just sing, guys. You've got all, all, both sides of the brain going on because that's the way God designed you. Let me flip it around just to maybe uh, emphasize the, the, uh, just how profound this is. You know, Satan wants to be worshipped. I was just talking with my uh, son's friend this last week. Satan wants to be worshipped, has always wanted to be worshipped. So how does he get people to worship him? He gets these guys that are in the music industry to sell their souls to him. And in exchange, he gives them all the fame, all the riches, all the sex, drugs, rock and roll that they could ever want. But they have to sell their soul to him. And then they become the worship leaders for Satan. Can I name some bands? I, this is really going to, especially if you're close to my age, the Beatles. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart, Hearts Club. Am I giving you songs that you're going to, I don't want to mess you up here, but Aleister Crowley is Sergeant Pepper that taught the band to play. He's on the album cover. The Eagles. Remember Hotel California? Oh, please don't start singing it, because you can't get it out of your mind. The only way to get it out of your mind is to replace it with a worship song. That's the only way. So please don't get stuck on this song, but you can check in. But you, I mean, you can check out, but you can never leave. So you look at the album cover, and in the window of this Hotel California is Aleister Crowley. Who's Aleister Crowley? A Satanist who bought Robert Plant and Jimmy Page's mansion. Pardon me. Robert Plant and Jimmy Page bought Aleister Crowley's mansion in the UK. And that's where the song Stairway to Heaven, the most popular song of all time, was inspired. Jimmy Page is quoted in Rolling Stone magazine as saying that they were sitting around the fire and all of a sudden Jimmy told Robert to get a pen and start writing down these words. And he had a spiritual utterance. And the words came to him through a demonic spirit. And not one word was changed. And they put the melody to it, the music to it. And it became what we know today as Stairway to Heaven. How ironic. One of the most satanic songs ever written and recorded. See, when you, it's like a drug. This is why it is, by the way, that you see the young people today. And this is so heartbreaking. I mean, they are, they are basically controlled demonically by the music that they're listening to and oblivious to the world around them. Because it's a drug, the way it acts on the brain, music. Now, I'm, I'm using that in, in a contrast because that's the dark side, the evil side, because Satan knows how powerful music is and worship is. He knows that it has the power to change somebody's life for good or evil. And it's changing people's lives for evil. This is how I came to Christ. I was heavily into <laughs> bands like ACDC. I'm on the highway to hell. All my friends are going to be there. By the way, here's a spoiler alert. Your friends might be there, but they're not going to be partying. I'm on the highway to hell, hell's bells. 
I mean, you, you look at just the words to these songs, and they are so satanic. Because Satan, Lucifer was the angel of the harp. He was the worship leader of heaven. So he's taken that, as powerful as music is, and he's used it to further his kingdom of darkness, because of the power that music has. Well now, let's bring that back to the power that music has in our lives when we praise and worship God. It is so powerful. And it might be the one thing that God would have you to do. And here's the last, last thing. What do you think you're going to be doing for all of eternity? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we've got the lyrics, actually. We can start practicing now in Revelation when we get to it. I think it's about chapter 4 or 5. When we're singing before the throne. Thank you, God, for giving us the words to the song, because I don't want to look stupid in heaven, <laughs> you know, before the throne going, you know, trying to, never mind. <laughs> no, we're going to know. As one said, you're not going to be more stupid in heaven than you are on earth. And for those of you that are taking issue with me using the word stupid, because you know who you are, uh, Proverbs 12.1, the word stupid's in the Bible. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So what do you think we're going to be doing for all of eternity? How about this? Why do you think we're going to be doing that for all of eternity? Because He is worthy of all of our praise, all of our worship. Do you know that's where the word worship comes from? Worthship. That's what we're going to be doing. And it's not going to be like, oh, is it that time already? First of all, there's no time in eternity. It's kind of like, okay, you got the song sheet. No, you should have it memorized by now. You know, it's time to worship the Lord for the next, you know, million years, because it's eternity after all. It's kind of like, wow, man, is that all we're going to be doing? And, and the world doesn't help, right? The picture of being in heaven on a cloud with a harp. No wonder they want to go on the highway to hell. I mean, wait a minute, that's all we're going to be doing is heaven is playing a harp? Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe, but it's not going to be like, man, I got to play the harp. No, it's going to be, I get to play the harp for Him, as I cast my crowns before Him, because He is worthy. And He created me for that. So why not get in on the action now? Why not experience this life-changing truth now? Why wait? Why wait for eternity? Do you know that your eternal life started the day that you surrendered your life to Christ and were born again of the Spirit of God? Your eternal life started on that day. Listen, I've been enjoying eternal, eternal life since 1982. When I, I was 42 years ago. Don't do that. I was four. I was four. No, I was 19. It's a long time ago. But I was, I, I experienced and tasted that the Lord is good since 1982. And I've never looked back. That's when my eternal life started. And I probably should just say this. This will be the last, last thing. Maybe that's when your eternal life started, but you never really started when your eternal life started. Start today. Today's the day. What better time than now? Why wait? Why would you? Praise Him. Just sing to Him. Yeah, but I'm supposed to make a joyful noise. When I sing, it's not very joyful. It's more noise than joyful. That's fine. You know, the beautiful thing about it is He doesn't hear what you sing the way you sing it. This is another thing that 
I'm so grateful for. He does not allow you to hear the same sermon I preach, for which I am eternally grateful. He takes it and tunes it. And then he hears it, and it blesses his heart, and it changes you. Okay. I better quit while I'm ahead. Capone will come on up and sing and lead us in worship so we can get more practice in. Go ahead, please stand up. We'll close in prayer and song. Oh God, the God who keeps us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for inspiring Jude to write this. How encouraging is this? How life-changing is this? Lord, I just want to pray for anyone that might be here in this service or watching online. And it's like you've been reading their mail. You know exactly what's going on. You know the heart. And you know what's going on in their lives. And this is what's been missing. And that can change today. So Lord, I just would ask, would you first of all encourage and strengthen that battle-weary, broken-hearted brother or sister in Christ, who's just really hurting, that you would put a new song on their lips, that they would sing and praise and just break forth into a glorious doxology of their own. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you that we have all of eternity to look forward to this. Lord, we want to keep you, the God who keeps us, in Jesus' name.